and welcome to Talking Till Dawn. I'm Martin, and as usual, I'm joined by Count Michael Von Whitehouse. How the heck are you, Mike? Good evening! I'm good, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Busy. I've been busy. Quite a lot going on between work and life stuff, but all good. All the better for working up a big old healthy thirst for blood, Michael. Always. Did I say blood? I actually meant talking head, pale ale. Uh, always, oh, yeah. always getting those two mixed up. Do you know what? Hold on. Hold on. That's how I lost my job as a phlebotomist. There's a fridge right here. Hold on. Awful business that was. Can't have you drinking alone, Martin. I'm a social drinker. There we are. <laughs> it's friend, sir. I have to say, I'm a bit of a pleb. I'm drinking a Budweiser, but I like it, so. Ah, we don't gatekeep drinks here. Don't sweat it. So... Have we done any vampires on Talk Until Dawn before, Mike? Absolutely not. We are going to do the Highgate vampire case at some point. Yeah, I knew we talked about that. We've just kind of, we've finally hit the critical number of episodes where I can't immediately reel off every single one of them. Maybe the dementia's kicking in. But it's a sad state of affairs if a show like this can get to 30 whatever episodes without covering a vampire. So, As a child, I was obsessed by vampires, both fictional and real, obsessed with them. Like, I don't mean to the point where I wanted to dress up as a vampire, although I did do that for Halloween a couple of times. I was actually more obsessed with Van Helsing, he was like, especially Peter Cushing. Vampire films and stories are right up my alley. I'll be surprised if you haven't heard this case. If you haven't, you're going to like it. First though, before we get into it, let's take a quick moment to welcome our newest Patreon supporters. At the Nightbird level, we're very happy to be joined by Stephanie. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And shining in the gloaming sky, Paul Denour and Zoe Tiplick, who join us at the highest Dawnstar level. And stars, you most certainly are, folks. Thank you, Paul and Zoe. If you would like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash talking till dawn. We are eternally grateful to everyone on there for their continued support. In fact, I want to give a little bit of credit to just a random selection here of a few of our long-term supporters. Folks like Marcy Graham Waldenville, Box and Wolf, Lauren Morell, Susie McHugh, Diane Lane, Stephen McNally, all the rest of you, every single one of you, thank you. Absolutely, and may I also say that I've been having issues with my microphone, and because of our Patreon supporters... I've now actually been able to order a new one so the show can continue. So huge thanks to everyone who's contributed so far. Papa needs a new pair of shoes, is that what you're saying? (laughs) What I'm saying is I I wouldn't have been able to go and get a replacement microphone probably if it wasn't for the Patreon stuff over the last few months. So it really is. It's a huge, huge help to keep the show going. 100%. You know, we realise not everyone is in a position to support us in that way, especially in the current economic climate. And you know, I totally get it. If we all signed up to the Patreon of every single show we ever listened to, we'd all be penniless, right? So we're totally cool if you just want to listen. If you'd like to support us in another way instead, you can do so by writing us a review or rating us on whatever service you use to get your podcasts. You can tell your friends about the show and generally just spread us around like honey. That wasn't a particularly appealing simile, but you get the idea. I was going to say spread us around like stale butter. (laughs) (laughs) What does stale butter look like? I have no idea. I don't even know if it can go stale. Anyway, shall we crack on? Yes, please do. The tiny picturesque village of Croglin stands in the county of Cumbria, formerly Cumberland, in the far northwest of England, about 20 miles south as the crow flies from the Scottish border at Gretna. The settlement itself nestles between fertile pasture lands and scattered woodland to the west and barren, looming hills in the east, where the land rises towards the high moors of the North Pennines. A cluster of quaint stone cottages, working farm buildings, an old churchyard and a pub all centre on a crossroads where a network of dirt farm tracks meet the narrow tarmac ribbon of the local B Road. With the exception of power lines and a few cars, Croglin in the 2020s still looks like a place that has survived the last two centuries remarkably unscathed. It's a tiny remote hamlet and not at all somewhere that's widely known outside of its local area. If you're a particular connoisseur of livestock feed, you might have heard of the Croglin Hay and Silage show held at the Robin Hood Inn each February. Don't miss it. 
But otherwise, put it on my calendar. If you're not a local and you've ever heard of the village at all, it's likely to be for one reason only: a chilling event, alleged event that's been recounted and retold in print for well over a century: the case of the vampire of Croglin Grange. If you're someone who grew up reading late 20th century mystery and folklore literature, there is a good chance you're familiar with the story. But in case not, well, the tale begins with the Fishers, a wealthy English family who, in past centuries, were in possession of a property named Croglin Grange, located just outside the village of Croglin itself. Croglin Grange, unusual for a country house of its kind, is described as being only a single story high but with a large terrace with sweeping views across the local countryside, looming hills, dark woods, and a small churchyard nestling in a hollow a short distance away. The Fishers were a growing family and found themselves in need of a larger property, so they purchased the vast Thorncombe Park estate near Bramley in Surrey and moved away from Croglin. They were obviously not short of a few quid, so instead of selling up, they decided to let out their old home. Enter the tenants, a sister and two brothers. In some tellings, they are named as Amelia, Edward and Michael Cranswell. That's something we'll come back to, but we'll use those names for clarity's sake. In any case, they signed a seven-year lease on the property, arriving in the late autumn. Not much information is given as to their background, but it's implicit that these are themselves the grown-up children of a wealthy family, presumably living together pre-marriage. It's possible that they may have taken Croglin Grange as a sort of long-term family holiday home, with their main residence being elsewhere in the UK, it's not entirely clear. But they settle into local life, they're thrilled with the house itself, its scenic outlook and its idyllic pastoral setting. They spend the winter there exploring the countryside and attending local social functions, falling in love with the area, and through their affability, generosity, By all accounts, they become quite popular with their neighbours, from the local farmhands to high society. They stay at Croglin Grange right through the winter and spring. Then there came one of those rare British summer days, between the usual weeks of relentless rain and slate grey gloom, when the blue sky just bursts wide open and the sun beats down on the shining green fields and the humidity climbs and somehow the heat seems to leapfrog all the way past pleasant and into the realm of the oppressive. The siblings each spent their day reading in the shade of a tree or lounging on the veranda. The suffocating air seemed to preclude any other kind of activity. After dinner, the coolness of night came like a blessing, and they sat up together on the patio and watched the full moon rise and etch the landscape, the trees, the hills in chiaroscuro silver. The siblings retired to their chambers for the night, but the summer night air, cool and soothing as it had seemed out on the veranda, hung oppressively in Amelia's room. She tossed and turned, but sleep refused to come. So instead she rose from bed, opened the shutters, and sat propped up on pillows, watching the striking play of moonlight across the scene outside, through the diamond-shaped panes of her window. A grove of trees divided the far end of Croglin Grange's acres of lawn from the hollow in which sat the old churchyard and its stones and subterranean crypts. In the gleaming night, the trees were a belt of darkness, except, she realised, for two dim lights that seemed to flit back and forth across the shadow of the woods, winking in and out as they wove their way behind and through the trees. She watched them probably more with curiosity than concern, until they emerged onto the lawn. Now she saw that they were something more than just disembodied lights. They were inset in a black shape of their own that seemed to coalesce out of the trees, a murky, indistinct, but inescapably solid figure, picked out against the shining moonlit dew of the grass, bounding towards the house towards her. A paralysing dread descended on Amelia. She wanted to run out into the hallway and shout for her brothers, but to get out of bed and approach the door meant getting closer to the window, and in her terror she found herself unable to do so. Outside, the figure continued its lurching approach, 
There seemed to be no doubt now that whoever or whatever it was, it was coming directly, deliberately, for Amelia's window. Until suddenly, it wasn't. Whether it had abruptly changed course as it entered a dip in the lawn, or the shadow of a tree, or whether it veered out of sight while she turned her gaze to the door and weighed escape, she couldn't afterwards be certain. She could only say for sure that she saw the thing coming for her one moment, and then only the lawn and the trees and the moonlight. She sprang up and ran to the bedroom door, but as she turned her back on the window, before she laid her hand on the key in the lock, she heard a sound. It was the sound of a finger scratching at the glass. She whirled around and saw, peering in at her, a hideous, distorted, discoloured face with hot, blazing eyes pressed up against the panes. By sheer reflex, she dived back into bed, because as every sleepless five-year-old will tell you, thin summer bed sheets widely known to be axe-proof. <laughs> she sat cowering under the sheets, listening to the nighttime visitor's fingers scratching and probing at the surface of the window. She knew, at least, the window was sealed, and that this intruder would find no way to open it, and would, surely, sooner or later, give up trying. And then the scratching changed to a sharp prying, pecking sound. She realised with a horror that was almost a physical torture that the thing outside was unpicking the lead that held the panes of the window in place. I'm hearing that, I'm in a man, that's not... That's coming from behind you, I think. <laughs> Jesus! Oh no, it is Jesus. We're fine. We're saved. <laughs> <laughs> what happened next, I quote from the story as recounted by Augustus Hare. The noise continued and a diamond pane of glass fell into the room. Then a long bony finger came in and turned the handle of the window. And the window opened and the creature came in. And it came across the room and her terror was so great that she could not scream. And it came up to the bed and it twisted its long, bony fingers into her hair, and it dragged her head over the side of the bed, and it bit her violently in the throat. The quote continues, As it bit her, her voice was released, and she screamed with all her might and main. Her brothers rushed out of their rooms, but the door was locked on the inside. A moment was lost while they got a poker and broke it open. Then the creature had already escaped through the window, and the sister, bleeding violently from a wound in the throat, was lying unconscious over the side of the bed. One brother pursued the creature, which fled before him through the moonlight with gigantic strides, and eventually seemed to disappear over the wall into the churchyard. According to this account, Amelia received some pretty nasty neck injuries in the attack. However, she was a stoical and resilient character, whereas a lot of people would have been turned into a gibbering nervous wreck by such an experience, doubly so for heroines of Victorian era accounts of the supernatural, I think. She managed to strike a rational and pragmatic note in the following days as she recovered and reflected on what had happened, reassuring her family that a reasonable explanation would surely be forthcoming, that her assailant was probably some deranged asylum escapee or transient weirdo, she would heal and answers would be had. And she was half right because in a few short weeks, indeed, she made a full physical recovery. But her doctor was sceptical that someone who had been subjected to that kind of shock would be truly unscathed by it, psychologically speaking. So he recommended that the family leave Crogland Grange for a while to give Amelia a physical and mental change of scene. So for the remainder of that summer, the three siblings travelled to Switzerland, which in the 19th century was the fashionable retreat for upper middle class Brits. And Amelia, I'm happy to say, you know, she doesn't ruminate. She immerses herself in the trip. She's out climbing mountains and picking flowers and visiting cathedrals and putting what's happened behind her about as much as anyone could be expected to do so in that situation. And at the end of the summer, it was she, not the brothers, who suggested they go back to Crogland Grange. They had, after all, signed and paid for seven years residency, and they had only stayed there for one, 
She refused to let her attacker rob her of the benefit of six years of upfront rent, I think, and six years of what should be happiness in the house and town she'd come to love. And after all, as Hare quotes, lunatics do not escape every day. And so, come the autumn, they return to England and to Croglin. For Amelia's peace of mind, the brothers moved to chambers directly across the hallway from hers and acquired a pair of pistols, of which they each kept one by their bedsides. Once again, the autumn and most of the winter passed without incident. No news ever reached them of asylum breakouts or rampaging madmen. No easy answers to what happened that night ever arrived, but life went on. The events and the mystery of the previous summer loomed ever smaller. Amelia's thoughts turned more each day towards the future. All was well. And then, one night in March, she was woken from sleep by a familiar sound. Ah, oh, no, fuck that. She opened her eyes, and there in the window was that same ghoulish face, its withered fingers pressed to the glass, scrabbling hungrily at the lead lining, glaring in at its unfinished meal on the bed. This time, Amelia found no impediment to opening her mouth and letting out a mighty, ear-rending scream. The boys leapt from their beds and raced straight out into the night, pistols in hand. The thing had already turned from the window and was bounding away down the great length of the Grange's lawn. Its speed was terrific, easily outpacing the two men, but this time they were determined not to let it get away. They opened fire after it. One bullet whizzed wide, the other embedded deep in the meat of the creature's thigh. It stumbled, but didn't stop, still keeping pace ahead of its pursuers in spite of its injury. Once again, it leapt over the wall of the old churchyard, but this time the brothers persisted in following it, entering the cemetery in time to see the figure somehow slip into a vault belonging to a long extinct family line. I say somehow because when Edward and Michael approached the entrance, they found it locked and inaccessible. The Cranswells raised the alarm that the attacker was back and sheltering in a subterranean burial chamber near the Grange. The next morning, a large crowd of locals joined the brothers in unsealing the tomb. A group of them ventured down into the heavy subterranean air. By the light of their torches, a gruesome scene splayed out before them. Every coffin in the vault was smashed open, its contents wrenched out, mutilated, dismembered, spilled haphazardly across the stone floor. Every coffin but one. To quote August here, Of that the lid had been lifted, but still lay loose upon the coffin. They raised it and there, brown, withered, shriveled, mummified but quite entire was the same hideous figure which had looked in at the windows of Croglin Grange, with the mark of a recent pistol shot in the leg. And they did the only thing that can lay a vampire. They burned it. What a story though, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of a very, very few honest-to-God vampire stories or pieces of vampire folklore to come out of Britain at least until the latter half of the 20th century when you have things like the Gorbals vampire hysteria in the 50s, the Highgate vampire in the 70s. Before that, the vampire is not a big player in British folklore, really. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a long tradition here. It really was more of a mainland yeah. Europe thing. That's where they come from, mate. <laughs> Bloody immigrants. <laughs> I know. That's why we voted for Brexit. <laughs> I didn't. Keep the vampires but out. But that's <laughs> the vampires. There are folkloric creatures that are somewhat analogous to vampires. In Scotland, the Bavanshee, essentially the Scottish counterpart to the Irish Banshee, is said to drink human blood in some stories. She also shapeshifts into a hooded crow and sometimes disappears in, though I don't think she's vanquished by, daylight. She also acts in a succubus-like fashion, luring men to their deaths, which jives particularly with like modern vampire fiction where vampires are often very overtly sexualized. Mm -hmm. While a lot of internet based sources lean heavily on that to sort of contrive a connection between the Bavanshee and popular vampire lore, 
those traits aren't really the very core of the Bavanshi legend. She belongs more to the category of a fairy tradition than an undead sort of afflicted entity, something much more along the lines of the Kelpie or, you know, sirens or mermaids of maritime superstition. In England, there do exist from the 11th and 12th centuries accounts of revenants, yeah. animated corpses, which may or may not possess full human faculties and do often attack or threaten the living, but don't drink blood especially, and they lack most of the other vampiric traits, certainly as we'd recognise them. I think a lot of the stories of revenants, I think they originally came from France in the Middle Ages. Mm. There's a book called The Ghost, A Cultural History, which talks about the development of the modern idea of what a ghost is and what its characteristics are, not just Mm -hmm. within fiction, but within folklore and allegedly real hauntings and things like that. But there's some really interesting stuff in that about the Revenant and about how the Revenant was this kind of halfway house between something that was spectral and something that was physical. Yeah. The ghost stories of like MR James and people like that really returned to the idea of the revenant because his his ghosts are very physical. They they're always they're a physical threat in a lot of cases. Yeah, they're always grabbing people and things like that. But the revenant was like a real worry for people and they used to place graveyards in certain places like further out of town. That's one of the stories anyway, was that they were worried about revenants coming home. Mm, yeah. Because sometimes there were these stories about people about people coming out of their graves and then staggering back into the village for revenge and things yeah. like that. But yeah. the idea of the revenant's really interesting. It's actually a, a type of creature that along with the ghoul as well, I don't think has been explored as much as things like vampires. I think part of the reason for that is in movies and stuff, you've got these very strong archetypes. Screenwriters and directors tend to let their creatures or their villains fall into certain tropes. And Mm -hmm. if you've got something like a revenant or a ghoul, it's very close to things like vampires and zombies. Zombies, yeah. In a way, it's easier to just follow what's been done before and it ends up becoming a zombie movie. Yeah. I can see why that happens. What's interesting, where it ties in a little bit to a previous talk until dawn and I don't want to talk about revenants too much but some of those accounts some of the English accounts such as the one mentioned in William of Newbury's History of English Affairs where a man in Berwick-upon-Tweed is said to have risen from the dead and taken to roaming the nighttime landscape followed by a pack of ravening barking hounds actually fall into the context of wild hunt type events which is Mm -hmm. something we discussed in its own episode again though except for these cases where later writers, mostly 20th century and later writers, try to repurpose lesser-known mythological creatures as vampires. Generally speaking, vampires before Dracula and the like were just not a very British monster, which makes this case kind of unique and adds a lot to the curiosity surrounding it. The Crogland Grange story more or less has its origin, in print at least, in the fourth volume of Augustus John Cuthbert Hare's autobiographical work, The Story of My Life. There is a bit of nuance there that we'll come back to, but for now, that's a good enough starting point. Hare was a Victorian author. Today, we'd probably call him something like a travel writer, something along those lines, but his work treads the genres of history, biography, genealogy, and other types of non-fiction. He also seems to have had a great fondness for ghost stories. Now, I don't mean he wrote supernatural fiction, not exactly, but he did in at least one or two of his works, notably his autobiography, take some relish in detouring to detail strange accounts associated with the people and places he was writing about. A famed raconteur, he befriended celebrities and spent a lot of time hanging out at stately homes hobnobbing with landed gentry, and that's how we get to the first written account of the Crogland Vampire. The Story of My Life, Volume 4, was published around 1900, but being autobiographical in nature, it's obviously all about looking back at things in the past. So, the vampire story is described as being first told to Hare 26 years previously, in 1874. He's recalling a dinner he attended in Northumberland held by Thomas Liddell, 
First Baron Ravensworth, at which a number of guests shared spooky anecdotes. I would imagine over drinks. A Captain Fisher, the fiancé of one of Lord Ravensworth's daughters, is the teller of this tale. He's a member of the Fisher Rowe family, the owners of Crogland Grange within the events of the story, the family who let out the property to the Cranswell siblings. So he's essentially saying, here's this weird thing that happened to some renters at my family's old property. Interesting to note here, 1874 predates the publication of Dracula by some 23 years. There are two key things to note here though. A lot of the later retellings of this in print, and especially online, use the Cranswell name for the tenants, and the four names Amelia, Edward and Michael completely without comment or source. This early version, as told by Fisher and recorded by Hare, makes no mention whatsoever of the tenants' names, only stating that they were two brothers and a sister. The other thing is, many, if not most, later writers place the incident itself in 1874 or even later. Again, the story as told by Fisher to Hare, in fact, makes no reference, no explicit mention of the year in which the events happened. We can probably discard any claims that it happened in 1875 or later, since we know the dinner at which the story was shared was held in June of 1874. Hare was very meticulous with his dates, you see. We can also be quite confident it didn't actually happen within 1874 either. There are certain pivotal details in the story that don't chime with the date of 1874 and we'll get to those in due time but even just taking the text of the account in isolation when you read it it does feel pretty heavily implicit that this is something that's supposed to have happened some years back if nothing else there's the fact that the Croglin vampire isn't even the first ghost story captain fisher tells at the dinner he tells one about a deathbed apparition that supposedly took place at the house of a Colonel McPherson of Glen Trum. Then he briefly recounts the sighting of a giant two-story tall banshee reported in Ireland, which turned out to be a two-story building, which was believed to have prophesied the death of one of the Hungerford family, before finally getting round to the story of the vampire at the window of his own family's ancestral home. Now, if the event, events described had happened just two to three months prior to this dinner, so the story mentions that the vampire was destroyed in March and this dinner happened in June, then I really don't think it would just be casually popping into his head after telling two yeah, other stories yeah. about unrelated people. It would be like first thing in his mind. Holy shit, guys, there was a fucking guys, vampire. you'll never guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, it would be the first thing out of his mouth. I think that alone gives it an implication of, at best, a long past event mm. or family legend. At worst, a story he's just made up on the spot. But for now, we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and stick with the idea that this is something that happened or was reputed to have happened at some point, most likely years, decades, or even centuries prior to 1874. While the story, as told to Hare, lacked these key facts on the date and the identity of the siblings, details that would be extremely useful in corroborating the claim if we had them, there are still threads to pull here. There's the supposed owners of Crogland Grange, named as the Fisher family. Hare mentions that his Captain Fisher was engaged to be married to Victoria Liddell, the daughter of Baron Ravensworth. A historical newspaper search shows that Victoria Isabella Liddell married Mr. Edward Fisher Rowe of Thorncombe, so we can say with some certainty this is Hare's Captain Fisher, and from there that opens the possible investigative thread of the Fisher Rowe family and their connections, if any, to Croglin. Secondly, there's the geographical angle. Does Croglin Grange match the extensive physical descriptions given in the account? Does the layout of the grounds match with the huge lawn and the hidden churchyard? Do people in the local area have knowledge of this story? Is it a local folktale? Can we find the actual tomb in which the vampire was discovered? So at this point I was thinking, well, this is only a two hour drive from Glasgow. This could well be a talking till dawn road trip. Well, 
It turns out I am far from the first person to think along these lines. Going right back to the decade of the 1900s, there have been attempts by journalists and writers to try and confirm or debunk the story by following these strands. The story first came under serious outside scrutiny in 1907 in Charles George Harper's Haunted Houses Tales of the Supernatural with some account of hereditary curses and family legends. Having recounted the narrative as it's presented in Hare's book, he then looks into the geography of the local area and finds something concerning. Quote, It is to be added from personal observation that there is no place styled Croglin Grange. There are Croglin High Hall and Low Hall. Both are farmhouses very like one another and not in any particulars resembling the description given. Croglin Low Hall is probably the house indicated, but it is at least a mile distant from the church, which has been rebuilt. The churchyard contains no tomb which by any stretch of the imagination could be identified with that described by Mr. Hare. What exactly does he mean by in no particulars resembles? Well, for one, neither high nor low hall are single story buildings, which is a very specific and emphatic detail of the story. Hold that thought for now though. I'm holding it. In 1929, Augustus Montague Summers, an author and erstwhile clergyman, legend, published the book The Vampire in Europe, a critical edition. Summers' writings on the occult, to take a short aside here, are extremely controversial, in no small part because he was an ardent proponent for belief in the reality of a malicious anti Christian witch cult in the early modern era and he tended to be sympathetic towards the historical cruelty and bloodshed yeah. of witch hunts. I had this book on witchcraft. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. My dad bought me it. Here, son, you'll enjoy this. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> so even in Summer's own era, like the 1920s, this was already something that was, you know, the witch trials and everything was already something that was looked back on as an abomination yeah. by his contemporaries. In other words, he thought that the wave of brutal witch trials that gripped Europe and North America in the 16th and 17th centuries were a necessary and justified reaction to a real threat. He was even responsible for translating into English the Malleus Maleficarium, the Hammer of the Witches, Heinrich Kramer's 15th century manual on torturing and punishing those accused of witchcraft, a book so extreme and twisted in its zealotry and bloodthirst that the Inquisition of the Catholic Church itself as in, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, the Inquisition, <laughs> not an institution normally recognised for its humanitarianism, condemned this book as cruel and unethical. That wasn't part of the book your dad got you, was it? Do you know, it was that long ago, I think I was in my early teens, and my dad just saw this book and knew, like I enjoyed reading about the kind of history of the paranormal, and yeah, I definitely remember reading that. I have a funny feeling that I did read a book, or part at least, of a book that he wrote on vampires. Yeah, well that's this one, The Vampire in Europe, a critical edition. Yeah, definitely didn't read them like cover to cover, but I dipped yeah. in and out. But not The Hammer of the Witches. No. What are you doing up there, Michael? No. Just building a breaking wheel, Dad. <laughs> yeah. The neighbours are witches, Dad. One of them's got a wart. <laughs> <laughs> So, Summers himself, despite converting to Catholicism in his 30s, found his extremist ideas at odds with the relatively more liberal and rational Catholic Church of the early 20th century. In fact, Bernard Doherty of the School of Theology at Charles Sturt University believes that Summers' fundamentalist and conspiratorial views about witches and demonology were a precursor to and strong influence upon the satanic panic of the later 20th century. Just to give the reader an idea of the sort of thinker we're dealing with here, right? So anyway, in addition to witches, as we've said, Summers also later turned his attention to werewolves and vampires, the existence of which he was similarly convinced of, and thereby we come to this, his book on the subject, The Vampire in Europe, a critical edition. Based on his self-professed belief in these supernatural threats, we might expect him to put up a robust defence of the Croglin vampire case. It would certainly have bolstered his ideology, but surprisingly he doesn't do that. Summers compared the account 
to the opening two chapters of the 1840s Penny Dreadful serial, Varney the Vampire. Mm. Varney was, and I'm sure you know, Mike, an incredibly popular work around the middle of the 19th century, although it's far, far from being a literary tour de force. It's usually credited as introducing what we now consider the traditional vampire to the British people and to English language literature in general. Well predating Dracula and also predating the 1870s backdrop to the telling of the supposed events at Croglin. In fact, Varney originated many, if not most of the tropes that we now consider standard for vampire fiction. Things like the vampire having sharpened teeth and so forth things that weren't necessarily part of the traditional vampire legends of Eastern Europe. What year was the John Polidori one, the the vampire? That was earlier than that, wasn't it? Let's see. A short work of prose fiction written in 1819. So there would have been mentioned in works predating this, but you have to... I remember that's pretty good. I read it years ago. I, I say it was pretty good, but I can't remember much about it, but... It was definitely in a collection that I had. I think the thing is with Varney the Vampire, it actually sucks. It's really badly written. I've never read it. I've heard that. But it was phenomenally popular. So yeah, I think there are various times when vampires are are mentioned in sort of literary writings, but they wouldn't have been as broadly popular across the entire British population to sort of inject the idea of what a vampire is. Anyway, Summers found such strong parallels between the Croglin tale and several passages at the start of Varney the Vampire that he more or less supposed it to be a made-up story heavily suggested, knowingly or unconsciously, by the storyteller's memories of Varney. Here's the section in question. Apologies as much of the language is absurdly flowery and ornate to the point of nausea. It'll fit in well with my short stories. (laughs) No, no, no. This guy was paid by the line of text, so yeah. he drags out every tiny detail to the nth degree. There's rumours that Algernon and Blackwood, one of my favourite sort of writers of ghost stories and weird fiction, there are rumours that he dragged out the way he wrote specifically because he was being paid by the word. Yeah, he did it a lot more gracefully. Yeah, than... he's tremendous. Well, you're about to see, you're about to see. The bed in that old chamber is occupied. A creature formed in all fashions of loveliness lies in a half-sleep upon that ancient couch. A girl young and beautiful as a spring morning. Her long hair has escaped from its confinement and streams over the blackened coverings of the bedstead. She has been restless in her sleep, for the clothing of the bed is in much confusion. One arm is over her head, the other hangs nearly off the side of the bed near to which she lies. A neck and bosom which would have formed a study for the rarest sculptor that ever providence gave genius to (laughs) were half disclosed. She moaned slightly in her sleep and once or twice the lips moved as if in prayer, at least one might judge it so, for the name of him who suffered for all came once faintly from them. Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. She has endured much fatigue and the storm does not awaken her. But it can disturb the slumbers it does not possess the power to destroy entirely. Oh. The thing is, see, some of some of that I'm listening to it and it may just be that, I mean, I'm biased, obviously, because you're my friend, but, you know, in the narrations you've done, I love listening to the way you read stories and perform them. So, like, I think you can probably make something that's substandard sound amazing, but when I listen to that, I'm thinking, it actually started off well, and then it just got increasingly ridiculous. So, the storm disturbs her but doesn't wake her up. Mm. The turmoil of the elements wakes the senses, although it cannot entirely break the repose they have lapsed into. It continues on like this, <laughs> retelling the same yeah. thing in different ways. It goes on for paragraph after paragraph like this, describing the woman and the room and the weather in mind numb and detail. The point is, there's a girl in the bed, okay? Blah blah blah. Another flash, a wild blue bewildering flash of lightning streams across that bay window for an instant bringing out every colour in it with terrible distinctness. A shriek bursts from the lips of the young girl and then with eyes fixed upon that window, which in another moment is all darkness, and with such an expression of terror upon her face as it had never before known, she trembled and the perspiration of intense fear stood upon her brow. What? What was it? She gasped. Real or a delusion? Oh God, what was it? A figure tall and gaunt, endeavouring from the outside to unclasp the window. I saw it. That flash of lightning revealed it to me. 
It stood the whole length of the window. She's saying all this out loud to herself, of course. <laughs> There was a lull of the wind, the hail was not falling so thickly. Moreover, it now fell, what there was of it, straight, and yet a strange clattering sound came upon the glass of that long window. It could not be a delusion. She is awake and she hears it. What can produce it? Another flash of lightning, another shriek. There could be now no delusion. A tall figure is standing on the ledge immediately outside the long window. It is its fingernails upon the glass that produces the sound so like hail, now that the hail has ceased. Intense fear paralyzed the limbs of that beautiful girl. That one shriek is all she can utter, with hands clasped, a face of marble, a heart beating so wildly in her bosom that each moment it seems as if it would break its confines. Eyes distended and fixed upon the window, she waits, froze with horror, froze with horror. The pattering and clattering of the nails continue, no word is spoken, and now she fancies she can trace the darker form of that figure against the window, and she can see the long arms moving to and fro, feeling for some mode of entrance. What strange light is that which now gradually creeps into the air, red and terrible, brighter and brighter it glows. The lightning has set fire to a mill, and the reflection of the rapidly consuming building falls upon that long window. It goes on and on and on. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I kid you not, it takes about three or four pages to essentially say the vampire gets into the room, walks across the room, and bites the girl's neck. Unreal. Anyway, <laughs> the following chapter then follows the character's brothers hearing her scream, rushing to her aid, encountering the vampire as it attacks her, shooting it, chasing it out into the night, shooting it again, apparently killing it before later the body is found to have disappeared. The similarities with the Croglin vampire case are quite staggering. In fact, I'd heard about this comparison before and thought, okay, you know, there's some parallels, but actually reading it, if it wasn't for this being published about 60 years earlier, I would have thought that the author of this was borrowing from Hare's book. Now that doesn't prove anything of course, but I have to agree with Summers on this point, it does cast some further suspicion on Fisher Rose's tale. And the fact that even someone like Summers, someone so utterly convinced of the reality of malicious supernatural forces, and consumed with conspiratorial fear of such things, someone with such a strong incentive to take this at face value, he studies this case, but then remains unconvinced by the evidence. That should probably serve to give us pause. Like I say, I, I definitely had the book on witchcraft that he wrote and I definitely read some of it. Mm -hmm. I have a memory as though I did have a book on vampires that Montague Summers had written. But, um, well, it's just he was overtly religious and there are some people who, for example, they will accept demonology, they'll accept the existence of non-human entities that are incorporeal because they see that as being mm -hmm. in line with the Bible but at the same time they won't accept something like a vampire because a vampire is really a perversion of the resurrection in, in some ways and that some people who are very religious especially within Christian belief systems, they believe that the only person who can resurrect the dead is Jesus Christ. So, was was Montague Summers an overt... Summers was a believer in vampires. So he was an overt... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wondered because maybe... And werewolves as well. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit different. But like, like I say, you know, <laughs> they're obviously real. <laughs> no, but it's a little bit different in, in terms of... And goats. In terms of... Um, did you say in ghosts? No goats. He believed that goats existed. What a sucker. Goats? Or ghosts? Goats. Goats. Goats? Yeah, goats. These supposed creatures that run around on four legs with two horns. <laughs> Absolutely preposterous. I lost my mind for a second there, man. I lost my mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, just I was just thinking that maybe that's why he was sceptical of it, was because it wouldn't play into some aspects of the Christian tradition to believe that the body can be resurrected because for some the only time that that happens is at the end of times and that's the reason by the way why some people who are Christian say that there's no such thing as ghosts or anything like that because one interpretation of 
the Bible is that when people die, they do actually, mm. they're dead. They don't go to heaven. They are actually dead. And that when Jesus Christ returns, they're then resurrected. They're then brought back. And that heaven is, is essentially, you know, a utopian earth or... Next on Bible Studies with Michael Whitehouse. <laughs> no, yeah, no. I find the Bible fascinating. I, I really do. So, yeah, Montague Summers... I find the Bible fascinating, Martin. (laughs) (laughs) Montague Summers was a believer in vampires and and werewolves and witches. And from what I can gather, I've not read the whole text of that book, but from what I can gather, the general thesis of it was that these are out there as a sort of threat in the world, but that this particular story he wasn't convinced by. Mm -hmm. But the next major spotlight on the case, at least as far as I can tell, came about 25 years later from a chap by the name of Valentine Dial. Now, you might have heard of Valentine Dial, Mike. What a name. Have you heard of him? Do you know who he is? Valentine Dial? If I have, I'm not remembering. So, not only was he a writer, he was also an actor. And much later on in his career, Mm. he would portray the Black Guardian on Doctor Who. He was (laughs) in the original 1963 version of The Haunting, opposite Julie Harris and Richard Johnson. No. Right, wait a minute, well... The Haunting is one of my favourite movies. Yeah, he was... So, who is he in? He's not the Doctor, is he? That's not the name of the... No, he played Mr. Dudley, whoever that is. Don't know, I've only seen it, like, once. Oh, Mr. Dudley, yeah. Uh, he's the caretaker. Okay. But most relevant to this, he was, in the 1940s and 50s, he had voiced the Man in Black, the narrator character in the BBC radio anthology series Appointment with Fear. Now, this was an enormously popular hugely influential show that ran for many years and has even had a number of revivals over the years since Uh, most recently in 2009 with Mark Gatiss taking on the Man in Black role following Dial's death in 1985. Anyway Dial's article on the Crogland Grange Vampire appears in the April 1954 issue of Fate magazine and on the surface it appears to include quite a lot of brand new information that didn't appear in Hare's account or in any other written source before it. It is, for example, the earliest known source to mention the Cranswells by name, and includes the detail of the creature being staked through the heart in addition to just being burned, something that again wasn't in Hare's piece, but does appear in many subsequent retellings, and that again is another detail that I think I don't think it originated recently, but it has risen in popularity in connection with the vampire legend, the image of staking the vampire as being the main way of killing it. You'll note what Hare says is the only way to kill a vampire is to burn it. So The iron stake is, I think, essentially where that, that story comes from. Iron was seen as a metal that could combat evil. It would sometimes be driven into corpses, but I think we've talked about this before, even in... Scandinavian countries, there is a tradition of of these posts being hammered into the ground because it would keep troublesome spirits yeah. contained underneath the ground. And there's, I know I keep going back to M.R. James, but there's a story called the Rose Garden, where there essentially is this post in this garden, and that's the purpose of it is it's there keeping these sort of troublesome sure. spirits at bay. Yeah. So as the popular image of staked vampire rose suddenly we start having that detail of the vampire being staked sort of retconned into the Croglin tale which wasn't there in the earliest retellings mm. potentially though with all the extra information this is a pretty exciting source that could really open up the mystery however as we so often find all is not as it seems with this source and in fact Dial's account is probably the one most responsible for muddying the waters and further fictionalising the events of the case. First of all, he includes absolutely no sources for any of his additions to the Croglin story. The tale is simply retold with these new details just casually popping up in the narrative. Researchers who have spent an inordinate amount of time looking into this haven't been able to find credible sources for these anywhere except in places that seem to have been directly influenced by Dial's version of the story so it's quite likely he's just made up the name Cranswell for example and that's then stuck and been the name people have used for the siblings in later retellings. Again the important context here is that Dial wasn't just a jobbing writer much less any kind of academic authority. 
he was a celebrity, someone associated in the public consciousness with just this kind of spooky story, and not because he's some expert, but because he's an actor who plays a character on TV, or on the radio, sorry, who presents horror fiction. So this is someone with certain expectations to meet and a public persona to adhere to. Like if, um, if Vincent Price had a column in a 1960s magazine where he talked about the paranormal, you might well be entertained by it, I would certainly read it, but you wouldn't necessarily automatically expect it to be the most in-depth authoritative thing where you can take every assertion at face value. No, you'd expect it to be a bit hammed up for sensation and to kind of capitalise on the writer's notoriety. And I think really that's what this is. The format of his show, Appointment with Fear, incidentally, often relied on older short stories being abridged, adapted, dramatised and generally sort of sexed up a bit for a mid-20th century audience. Has he basically just done the same thing with Hare's supposedly non-fictional account? As I say, the additional details Dial brings to the tale have no corroboration or sourcing and he deviates from the previously established details without remark. For example, Dial makes the very confident assertion that, quote, the Cumberland phenomenon, which is what he calls the Croglin vampire case, can be definitely placed in the years 1875 to 76. And again, that doesn't seem to be possible because the story was told to Hare in 1874, a year earlier than that. Some might be tempted to argue here that maybe it's uh, Hare got the dates in his journal mixed up and he was actually told the story later and maybe Dial is working from some other more accurate source that he just neglects to mention. But unfortunately even this doesn't stand up to scrutiny. As we'll see, we do in fact have some pretty strong evidence to suggest that the events, if something happened even remotely resembling any of this, it happened much earlier, the 17th or 18th centuries. In the early 60s, Francis Clive Ross, a publisher and writer on comparative religion and the occult, turned his attention to this case for what would become an article in the spring 1963 issue of Tomorrow magazine. Clive Ross had first encountered the story through Dial's piece and had arrived at most of the same conclusions as we have here regarding Dial's writing on the subject, namely that it was fictionalised beyond all historical usefulness. But he was intrigued enough by the story itself that he soon found himself corresponding directly with surviving 20th century descendants of the Fisher Rule family, one of whom informed him that the story was still told within the family, at least as late as her own childhood, when an aunt would narrate the tale by the fireside every Christmas Eve. Now, the telling of fictional Christmas ghost stories is a bit of a British tradition, so Clive Ross's first suspicion here was that this has all grown up out of an M.R. James style fireside tale, something that had entered into family tradition and then taken on the air of truth just by repetition, by being told for many years and years and years. In 1962 though, he took his investigation to Croglin itself, physically visiting the village, the churchyard and Croglin Low Hall and interviewing the locals. They were all vampires. He noted that the local churchyard clearly did not match the one described in the story. However, in the lobby there, he discovered an information sheet that explained a second church once existed in Croglin, at Croglin Low Hall. Quote, Croglin Low Hall is the ancient manor house of Little Croglin. It belonged to the Dacre family until 1589. There was a second church in Croglin here, probably serving as a private chapel to the house. On visiting Croglin Low Hall, Francis Clive Ross was directed by the owner to a bricked up window on the ground floor to the left of the front door, which he was told was, at least according to local legend, the window through which the vampire entered to attack the young woman. Now, it's likely that, in fact, the window was bricked up not to keep vampires out, but in order to save money when the window tax of 1696 was introduced. This was a method of valuing a building for property tax purposes on the basis that a surplus of natural light was a luxury in those days, so a house with more windows would tend to have a lot more value tied up in it, thus would be taxed higher. Huge mistake to move into a glass house in that period. Oh yeah. 
greenhouses were a fortune. It's just one window, I swear. In order to avoid the tax or to bring their home down into a lower tax bracket, many owners bricked up some of their windows. In fact, to this day in Scotland and England, it's not at all uncommon to see old buildings with bricked up lintels that have never been returned to use as windows, even... Is that why then? Wow, yeah. that's amazing. It's centuries since that that's law incredible. ended. That's yeah. incredible. Never, I never knew that, but you see that all the time. Yeah. You do sometimes see it in newer buildings where a developer has been told you need to match the window cadence of the nearby windows, but the developer doesn't want to put that many windows in because either because it's too expensive or... Mm-hmm the layout he has planned doesn't allow a window to be put there so they'll put like fake ones a pastiche of a window almost to kind of match yeah but if you see it on an old building in most cases it's because of the window tax of uh, 1696 according to clive ross there were four other bricked up windows in Croglin low hall so it seems likely that this had a financial rather than sinister motivation behind it but it's interesting that the very idea of this being the vampire window shows that this story did have at least some life as a local folktale. It wasn't just something that was told over drinks. Mm. More curiously, he also noted the presence in the very room reputed to be Amelia's of a heavy corbel in the wall just below the level of the ceiling, the ground floor ceiling. Was a corbel? It's an architectural feature that juts out from a wall. It can be an ornate stone plinth or a simple wooden beam or metal girder, but in essence it's a device for supporting a weight above it. What was notable about this corbel is that it didn't seem to be supporting anything in particular, thus its placement didn't really make any sense, unless it had been built to support a heavy structure directly above, for example, a roof. A roof that it no longer held because it had since been raised with the addition of an upper story. Mm. Clive Ross's key source was a lady called Dorothy Parkin, who was the widow of the local landowner that included the Croglin property. She told him that not only did she believe the building had been extended with an extra floor around 1720, so in other words, it better resembled the one-story building in Fisher Rose account prior to that date but she had documentation actual deeds indicating that prior to 1720 the Croglin Low Hall had indeed been known as Croglin Grange it gets better Clive Ross's investigation identified an area near Croglin Low Hall locally known as Church Field there is no church in Church Field no obvious tombs but local tradition holds that it is indeed the location of a former churchyard filled with now unmarked graves. Mrs Parkin recalled that when she first moved to the area in 1933, the field had been littered with stones, presumably from a dismantled ruin that once stood there. She further recalled that at some time during her life in Croglin, a farmer had tried to plough over that field but was unable to complete the job due to masses of stone foundations underlying the topsoil. So, what we find then is that while the architecture and layout of locations as they stand today seem initially to contradict fundamental details of the story, when you get back to 1720 and earlier, at that point, about 150 years before the dinner in Northumberland where Edward Fisher Rowe shared the tale with Augustus Hare, suddenly the pieces start fitting together. Up to 1720, the house is single story, exactly as described. So, does that validate the events and the details of Fisher Rose's story? Does that lead us cleanly to a date range for these events? Yes, good night everybody. Not so fast. In 2005, Richard Whittington Egan, a well-known true crime writer and a personal friend of Francis Clive Ross, checked at the records office in Carlisle for ownership and tenancy records relating to Croglin Low Hall or Croglin Grange. He discovered that the Fishers, in fact, had never been the owners of the property but were themselves lessees, renters, and that they took up the lease in or around 1809 from the real owner at the time, a widow called Mrs Burroughs. Now, 
we might still be able to square that with Fisher Rose's story if we accept that maybe he just glossed over the fact his family weren't the actual owners. The story was told at an upper class dinner, maybe he didn't want to admit that his family had ever been anything but wealthy landowners. Or maybe he just wasn't aware of the full details of the ownership, maybe the family were subletting to another family. But there's a much bigger inconsistency here that the keen-eared among you might have noticed. Given the importance that the single story layout has in this tale, if Croglin Hall was a two story building from around 1720 onwards and the Fishers didn't take on the lease until 1809, then that means if the supposed incident did happen as described, it can't have happened while the Fishers were in possession of the house, not by a long shot. So, one way or another, the story can't have happened exactly as Fisher Road described it. So, okay, what if we discount the single story detail as just some added colour that's not really important to the meat of the incident, in that case we still have to deal with the church. We've discussed already how Francis Clive Ross's investigation turned up a local oral tradition surrounding the former existence of a church and tombs in Church Field, which could have been the location of the vampire's tomb. But Whittington Egan was able to go further and more or less confirm that such a location did once exist. John Speed's 1610 map of Cumberland shows a Croglin church located south of Croglin Water, close to Croglin Parva. Parva meaning small. This was the old name for the collection of houses and farmsteads outside the main body of Croglin, and that included Croglin Low Hall or Grange. The existing church is at Croglin Village and is north of the river, so this church marked south of the river is clearly a different location and much closer to Croglin Grange or Croglin Low Hall. I can confirm from my own research that Christopher Saxton's 1576 map and John Jansen's 1646 map show the same thing, while later maps, such as Thomas Donald's 1774 map of Cumberland, give no hint of this other church. Whittington Egan found documents linking the Benedictine monks of Wetherill Priory to what is presumably this earlier church at Croglin Parva, and that this church was probably destroyed or at least reduced to a ruin by Oliver Cromwell's parliamentarians between 1642 and 1651. Sorry, that's the cat scratching my chair. Oh, that's how it starts, Martin. Scratching at the window, then scratching yeah, at your scratching chair. Scratching at the chair, scratching at the neck. Then scratching your boss. This ruined church and graveyard would eventually be reduced both by natural deterioration and the theft of stones for later buildings to the hidden foundations that Mrs. Parkin recalled seeing in her youth. So, this too points to a much earlier date for the setting of any potential vampire attacks. The churchyard near Croglin Low Hall, and by that I mean the ruin of the church, seems like it was more or less gone by the late 18th century. Certainly by the 1770s, it was no longer being shown on maps. Dorothy Parkin, Clive Ross's local guide in Croglin, was clear that she believed the incidents described in the story took place in the 1680s, about 30 to 40 years after the church was ruined in the Civil War, but while most of its structure and its tombs were still standing, that's roughly 120 years before the Fisher family arrived on the scene. Of all the time periods in which this could have happened, this seems to make the most sense. So, what we can say with some certainty is that the events could not have taken place during the time the Fishers were associated with Croglin Low Hall. Assuming for the moment then that the tale wasn't just invented by Edward Fisher Rowe for entertainment purposes, perhaps borrowing from a little bit of local history for colour, if it was a real event or based on a real event, then it must have been an account from before the time of the Fishers passed down to them by the previous owners or other local people who perhaps had heard it from their elders. And in that case, Fisher Rowe must have updated it to involve his own family in the retelling, in much the same way that urban legends have their provenance abridged so that they always happen to a friend of a friend instead of like a friend of a friend of a friend 62 times removed. The closer you bring it to the here and now, obviously the more immediate and gripping the story seems. 
it makes it a much more effective fireside shocker. The inconsistencies between the account and the historical context are certainly suspicious, but they don't disprove that something strange happened. They just confirm the suspicions I think we both had that the story is at least heavily embellished and fictionalised. Perhaps a little more damning though is the complete absence of any other written accounts of this event predating Hare's book. A visitation by an apparently undead creature in the 17th or 18th centuries, especially one involving multiple witnesses, because bear in mind the story involves a large number of townspeople being involved in the slaying of the monster, with an upper class or upper upper middle class heroine, absolutely would have been ripe fodder for the newspapers and pamphleteers of the time, lest we be tempted to think that events like this would be easily lost to history in this period, it's important to be aware that there's enough material for a whole Talk Until Dawn episode, maybe even a whole series of episodes on the massive 17th century boom in woodcut pamphlets detailing alleged supernatural encounters, strange phenomena, witchcraft, yeah. demonic apparitions. They were phenomenally popular. It's one of the main areas where supernatural fiction kind of came yeah. out from as well was the uh is it the apparition of, of mrs veal or is that, is that the name of it there are some stories that were passed off as real ghost stories yeah that would then essentially influence a lot of writers later on uh, when they were creating fiction yeah definitely because they were phenomenally popular they were highly lucrative there was a huge demand, they were widely circulated and publishers were always looking out for these kinds of stories, whether they were real or not, I suppose. But such an incident like this is, I think, extremely unlikely to have gone unreported even in the 17th or 18th centuries, especially maybe in the 17th or 18th centuries. So the fact that no such record appears to exist anywhere before Hare's book is a little bit of a problem. It's not a complete showstopper, obviously, but it raises yet more questions. So, of course, we're never going to get to the bottom of this here tonight. We can only say that there are a few viable origins for this story. For one, it remains entirely possible that the tale was made up out of whole cloth in the late 19th century for the purpose of having a story to tell at this dinner. Perhaps taking Varney the Vampire's inspiration, with the originator possibly being here himself in his book, but I think much more likely if either of the two men invented the Kroglin vampire, it was Edward Fisher Rowe, due to the fact the story weaves in these obscure details of Kroglin Low Hall's history, details that Augustus Hare just wouldn't have casually known about, but Fisher Rowe probably would have. If Hare was involved somehow in making it up, he likely had Fisher Rowe's help and blessing in doing so, not only because of those historical details, but because, especially at that time, you couldn't just go around putting words into the mouths of powerful gentry, especially in the medium of nationwide publishing, unless it was genuinely an accurate quote they'd be happy to see in print, or at the very least unless they were in on it and willing to let you use their name in connection with your story. There could be reputational and legal repercussions for doing that. Hare seems to have been a respected, well-liked mover in those circles, so if he says Fisher Rowe told him the story, I think he probably did. Even if Hare did make up, he must have made it up closer to when he claims to have heard the story in 1874 than the date the story was published in his autobiography around 1900. And we know this thanks to Anthony Hogg, author on the blog Diary of an Amateur Vampirologist, who found references to the Kroglin vampire that actually predate Hare's The Story of My Life but represent not independent corroboration of the tale, but rather accounts by people who heard Hare verbally retelling Fisher Rose's story at social functions years before actually putting it into print. So here we have Andrew Lang, who in 1887, reviewing J. Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, in which he quips, that work will give you the peculiar sentiment of vampirism will produce a gelid perspiration and reduce the patient to a condition in which he will be afraid to look around the room, 
if while in this mood someone tells him Mr Augustus Hare's story of Crogland Grange, his education in the practice and theory of vampires will be complete and he will be a very proper and well qualified inmate of Earlswood Asylum. Likewise, Edward Wood, the Earl of Halifax and Viceroy of India during the 1920s, recalled in 1957 Augustus Hare regaling his family with the story during either the late 1880s or early 1890s. And I remember, but I think he usually came in either summer or autumn, Augustus Hare making all our flesh creep with his story of the vampire at Crogland Grange, which he could only tell when he wore a very much ribbed shirt so that picking his shirt with his nail he could represent the vampire picking the mortar from the window pane to get in. <laughs> that's a classic just like you were doing earlier on that's a, that's a sort of classic teller of oh yeah macabre tales you know I think Probably about following like, his footsteps there yeah I was thinking about my dad you know the way he used to tell ghost stories to me and my friends and there would always be some some sort of use of something that was around yeah to make a noise or you know it's actually a lovely image yeah Alternatively, maybe the story did long precede both Hare and Edward Fisher Rowe. The story could, for example, be a fictional ghost story handed down the generations of the Fisher family, as suggested by the family member who was interviewed by Francis Clive Ross and recalled relatives terrifying them with it in childhood. Or it could be something that originated independently of the Fisher family, a local legend around the Crogland area which would make sense given that again the story is dependent on details that predate the fishers moving to the area. Once again researchers have found that the story does exist and does circulate locally. However I would urge caution because at this stage or really from the early 20th century onward the story is well known enough in the UK that it's really impossible to weed out what if anything of the locally told version is the real original story and what has just been sort of backward contaminated from locals reading Hare and Dial and other later retellings. You know, it's even possible that the story was never an organic piece of folklore around Croglin until locals were exposed to these later sources along with the rest of the country. What's interesting is that a few of the accounts collected from interviews with locals, interviews carried out by the likes of Francis Clive Ross, include details that only seem to have appeared in Valentine Dial's extremely popular but extremely sensationalised and seemingly embellished version of the tale, details like the woman victim being called Amelia Cranswell, for example. And this suggests that either Dial had in fact done some painstaking on-site homework to come up with these previously unreported facts, despite not giving any sources or any corroboration for having done that, or it indeed proves that the local version of the story is at best heavily contaminated by later renditions of questionable accuracy and therefore it's not the sort of virgin unspoiled time capsule of folklore we might wish it was. And unfortunately I think the latter is probably more likely. The story has been so popular for so long and so thoroughly magnified in sensational publications that oral versions in the wild, even those from the immediate local area, are quite limited in how much they can be trusted. There's maybe a lesson there in how these stories feed on themselves. Nevertheless, if it's not a simple fictional ghost story, then it probably had some kernel of truth to get the ball rolling. So what might that be? Brian Dunning, of all people, speculates in an episode of his show Skeptoid that perhaps the story has its origin in an attempted break-in and assault occurring sometime in the preceding centuries, involving a frightening but nevertheless human attacker, and that could explain both where the original seed of the story came from and also why it wasn't maybe deemed notable enough to be widely recorded and discussed prior to the late 19th century. Which it would have been, you know, the discovery of a real honest-to-God vampire revealed and slain in front of a large number of witnesses would have been an absolute phenomenon in almost any time period this side of the invention of the printing press. But in the right circumstances, a break-in by a human criminal, perhaps resulting in an assault, could certainly have been traumatic enough 
to leave a minor local folkloric impact, perhaps even just within one family without necessarily garnering press interest at the time, we might imagine a fugitive or a perverted itinerant sheltering in the Cromwellian ruins of an abandoned churchyard, roaming the area by night, perhaps spotting a young woman watching him from her ground floor window and taking the opportunity to attack her. Something like that could easily become inflated through repeated retellings to eventually arrive at claims of a literal vampire. And we've seen how that has happened, even just between Hare's account and Dial's account, separated by a few years, we see the exaggerations and the additional details creeping in. So you have to imagine that that process was also taking place unseen and unrecorded before the story was ever put to paper. If the tale did survive for generations as an oral account, how much embellishment had it undergone before it reached Hare's ear? Something about that reminds me, so I hesitate to bring it up because it isn't very pleasant, but there, there is a paraphilia around biting and injuring people. Um, mm. I unfortunately know this because I'm too mind whether to tell this story or not. I moved around quite a lot growing up. I went to a few different high schools and for the listeners this story does involve a child coming to harm so if you don't want to hear about that then skip forward I would say about five minutes and one of the schools I attended for about three years was in Dunoon in the small town of Dunoon when I was there there was a guy a year or two older than me who me and my friends he wasn't a friend but he was someone who was one of the characters that you would see in the halls in the corridors in stairwells and things and we used to sometimes go and talk to him because he was kind of like a bit of a neck beard you would probably describe him as now mm. one of these guys who just talked a lot of shit but it was kind of funny to see what sort of shit he was going to talk you'd go up and ask him questions just to set him off on a rant about stuff it was just one of those sort of strange characters that you would be curious to see what they would do or say yeah and i remember he was always telling these kind of ridiculous stories you know, I, I know how to break into Fort Knox. Well, what are you talking about? You can break into Fort Knox. What are you going to do? You're going to go in with guns? Like, no, 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 no. First, what you do is you get a crossbow and you go to the barracks, you know, and he'd have some ridiculous thing that he'd thought out. And it just seemed like... A, Mate, that's how you do it. That's 100% yeah, how you that's do exactly it. it. Yeah, James Bond. <laughs> um, anyway, I moved away. Moved away to another school. Mm. Forgot all about that guy. Done a few more years of high school. And then... A family member who still lived in Danoon informed me that someone who had been at the school at the same time as me, um, did you know this guy? He was a couple of years above you and I was like, the name rings a bell, but I can't quite place it. He said, well, apparently this guy had been arrested and sent to prison. He'd, he'd been at a party with a group of people. So it was like a small group of them partying at this house. Had gone upstairs and everyone just thought he was going upstairs to the toilet, but he'd actually gone upstairs to the bedroom of a young child that lived in the house. Oh, God. And and then I can't remember, did they hear a scream or was there something, but they went to see what was wrong, and he'd, he'd attacked the child with his teeth and bitten the child, like, multiple times over their body. The child survived, thank God. Horrific, traumatic assault, but it turned out that the guy he it's not the first time that guy had done something let's be honest well no i think it was i, th- I think mm, what just that you know of no so i very much what 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 age was he he was like 18, mm, 18 i very 19. much i very much doubt it well maybe he did something but he hadn't done that because you don't do that and get away with yeah, it right yeah it's escalated but the point was um Keevil was the guy's name was the guy's surname Keevil, and um he'd written a diary where he basically described in detail how he would like to bite people and injure people and do all this and listing biting victims and all sorts of stuff. He got sent away for quite a while and then I was, I was trying, racking my brains to try and think what he looked like if I'd ever crossed paths with him because I must have been there at the same time and I, I asked... David Keevil. Did you find it? Yeah, David Keevil. Yeah. Well, there's only a few people who I still know from that time. I spoke to someone... Who, oh my god, they bit off part of the boy's tongue. Yeah. Ah. Oh. So I asked someone, they described him, instantly clicked it was that guy with a neck beard that used to have all these weird stories and 
yeah, it just really kind of unsettled me. He wasn't like a friend, so it wasn't a big deal, like, oh my God, my best buddy's done this. But he was someone who, I would have recognised him in the street and I used to talk to him. So that was quite, you know, that's what came into my mind in thinking about this, is if, if that had happened with a stranger in a past century and there was no big explanation, no one finds a journal explaining what his motivations were and everything, it's very likely that that would have maybe been given some sort of supernatural explanation this was a vampire or you know i i i i agree man i'm like well i'm listening to you obviously mate but just i've just read read a little bit about that case there and the fact that he was sentenced to 12 years but only seven in custody yeah someone like that should never be allowed to walk amongst the public again yeah i don't know whether he did get out or whether it's you know, absolutely or, horrific I don't know what sort of controls he's under now but yeah so that's sprung back into my mind in thinking about this and thinking about someone breaking in and, and attacking someone with their teeth it doesn't have to be a vampire to do that so the, you could almost have this story up to the point of finding him in the grave as a sort of mummified corpse up to that point it could almost just be a human attacker you know yeah that's what I was thinking when you were talking about the folkloric aspect of it and I thought well you know it could have been someone who even you know even if you think about someone just breaking into a house mm -hmm. you know yeah. things things can be twisted over the way especially if it's like this old house that's that's kind of in the middle of nowhere and, and people can add aspects to it but it's like I remember my friend's sister he was only a baby I think at the time she was older and she woke up with a man in her room. Luckily, he never did anything. He was just a he was a burglar. I see, he was just a burglar. Right. He was fine. He was a good guy. No, he was uh, he'd broken into the house, and they had to move because she just couldn't sleep in that house after that experience, which is totally understandable. It's horrifying, but you know, you just wonder with something like this. It doesn't even need to have been someone that came in and bit someone. Yeah. Yeah. It could have just been someone breaking in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Something that might additionally have helped suppress the story from wider awareness would be if the scenarios involving the shooting, tracking and burning of the vampire actually have their origins in an incidence of vigilante action against a human sexual predator of some kind. Perhaps something that therefore could not be allowed to go beyond those directly involved and their immediate circle of friends for fear of the law. You know, the basic thrust of the story, as I say, is a woman being attacked in her bedroom and then her brothers seeking out the attacker and burning him to death. You almost don't need the element of, of vampirism for that to play out. Or maybe it was just a vampire, you know, just some garlic-hating bastard who got his just desserts. <laughs> In terms of further study, Clive Ross and Whittington Egan have been so thorough it's hard to know what the next move would be in trying to dig any deeper in this. Maybe some sort of geophysical study of church fields could answer the question of whether there truly remain forgotten underground crypts in the area. Maybe there's something to be found in parish records or printed materials from outside Croglin about a roaming biter of some kind who could have uh, served as an origin. A roaming biter? A roaming. <laughs> maybe it was. Maybe the vampire could be from any time period. Maybe there's still value in following up the Cranswell angle, perhaps using the genealogical perspective to try and find any Cranswells who might have been in the area. Ultimately, though, I think more likely than not, this is going to prove to be yet another case of we'll never know. I would love to be proved wrong, but I have real doubts anyone will ever get to the bottom of this because I think if any historical primary documentation of the events existed, it would have been found by now. Maybe not, but if nothing else, there's a good amount of local history relating to Croglin that would have been that would have gone almost unnoticed, if not outright lost to history, were it not for the interest in this story. The forgotten ruins of the old church, the Benedictine monks of Croglin Parva, the changing patterns of ownership and land use, the kind of information that is, to me anyway, so often the real payoff to looking at these anomalous topics. 
Did I really expect to find proof that a genuine supernatural vampire trumped the northern border country? Unlikely. Do I actually believe in vampires? No, probably not. If we did come up with irrefutable evidence of that, or someone did, it would be a worldwide phenomenon, it would be a world changing event. But in reality, I think what draws me to these kinds of stories, at least as much as, you know, the lure of the sinister, is all the secondary stuff, all the incidental history I get to find out about. Yeah. Maybe it's a bit trite to say the real talk until dawn is the things we find out on the way, but that is how I feel sometimes about these. Anyway, I'm rambling off into the bushes now. That is, that was the vampire of Croglin Grange. Back to the other thing I'm always fascinated by when we do these episodes, and that's your take on this, Michael. What do you think? Yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I think the more you, you talk about... You always say that. I'm going to have a compilation of... Yeah, just me saying that's fascinating. What's this, episode 36? Yeah. I must have 36 <laughs> versions of you saying <laughs> Yeah, it's like I so. always hate... Because I always say that's interesting and people often say that's interesting to mean shut up. Uh, did you, I? I, you know, and I genuinely don't mean that. When I say that's interesting, it's like, I mean that's interesting. Yeah, like I said at the beginning, I love stories of vampires uh, I love the folklore around and the more you talked about this the more the more familiar it was but I think that yeah like we talked about I think the idea that it could have some basis in reality it could have some basis in the idea that someone has broken into someone's house it's interesting to me as well that there are some types of crime which may be modern there are some crimes which may only start to happen once someone's kind of broken that threshold. I hate to bring it up because it's such a contentious issue at the moment, but you look at the tragedies of school shootings, and regardless of how you feel about that, about the debate in America about gun laws, there is this idea that once someone sort of crosses that line, and especially if it then becomes perpetuated in the news cycle and things like that but human beings seem to like pick up ideas mm -hmm. and they pick up ideas from other people and then they become obsessed by it you know people who are obviously extremely malevolent yeah. when it comes to things like school shootings but I just wonder if there's certain types of crime are perpetuated by someone doing them first and then people kind of copycat them over and over and over again and then they, yeah. they become like spring Hill Jack situation yeah absolutely I mean you talked about the possibility that you know when did this story originate was it the 1800s was it the 1700s when did it happen and you wonder if there's certain types or you know like the idea of, of having a an intruder in your house it's funny it almost feels like a modern concept I don't know why mm. you know Maybe that's just because of the films that you see where it's like, yeah, well, if someone turns up to your house and it's the 1700s, they're probably just going to burn it down rather than actually sneak in through a window. But, you know, did those sorts of crimes happen all the time? And were there predators? Were there prowlers, you know? Oh, 100%. Definitely. Definitely. Maybe the incidence was less, but we know that even in... We don't tend to think of these things happening in the early part yeah. of the 20th century, but they did. You know, they did. They just weren't reported uh -huh. as heavily. There was less sensational reporting, and certain things weren't maybe considered as proper to write about in public. But yeah, theft and break-ins and, you know, there's literary works and things about rape, for example, going right back, you know, the, the Virgin Spring and, you know, the, there's... yeah. But it's a different thing, though, rape is... Yeah, but people breaking in to attack someone, yeah. you know, they're going to be like, well, there's a window, there's a window here, so... Yeah. I know what you're saying, that it seems like a modern crime, but... I don't, I, I don't know. I wonder in some ways because... Some crimes are driven by yeah. ideas because they're... Like, so something like a school shooter, you have someone who's maybe consumed with rage and, and looking for an outlet, and then they see examples of something they can do and uh -huh. someone that they can idolize that they can model themselves upon and follow a pattern that sort of something internal yeah. and something external coming together but there there are other crimes that that are internal they, they originate from an internal sort of impetus maybe that internal impetus has been put there by 
their experiences in life, you know, nature versus nurture and that kind of thing. But, you know, if you're someone who is has these sort of paraphilias and um, a lack of restraint, a lack of, um, what's the word, inhibition, mm-hmm. that could be caused by head injury. It could just be your, your makeup. You could just be a psychopath. So that kind of crime, I don't think, requires that you're copying. It can probably emerge yeah. from that. You know, not having that around probably not having the example of these things happening in the news and in films and things like that probably reduces maybe the number of people who are tempted to do that but I don't think it annihilates it because ultimately it comes from within Mm. the desire to do that must come from within these people yeah and the act of going I am going to go and attack someone there's not it's not like a big elaborate thing that requires the pattern of someone else doing it to Mm. copy like a school shooting you have multiple guns, you go in sometimes, you have bombs, you shoot the people you don't like, you maybe trap people in a room. That's all stuff they've copied from each other. Yeah. It's almost like a kind of dialect of school shooting that has developed over time. But then but I, I do kind of feel, I kind of feel in general though that there may be some really basic human behaviours that we think are primal. They may be learned behaviours from, from kind of copycat and other people. Mm-hmm. I was just uh, thinking about that that it's weird that just it kind of feels to me like almost like a kind of modern crime you know like if i break into someone's house back then i get a pitchfork in the face anyway um yeah with regards to the case it would be interesting if there was some kind of event that happened in the distant past i don't agree with the point that i think you said that brian dunning said that it would have been like a much bigger deal if it had actually happened as written down that it would have been much more kind of... Oh, I think it would have been. See, I disagree with that. Depending on what time this apparently took place, I'm not so sure. I think there's... I think the way that news was kind of reported and stories were perpetuated, certainly back then, I think it's possible that some pretty incredible things could happen and they could just fall through the cracks. My personal belief is that the majority of human knowledge is not written down. Knowledge is maybe the wrong term. Human information, the majority of it's not written down, you know. Like nobody writes down that well, Mrs. McGaskill next door is... She's taking in another cat again. Aye, but this is not on that scale. No, I like, know you're going to say, like, those things are prosaic. Yeah. But it would depend where about it happened. There are things that, in our country, we would think are incredible, unbelievable, that could happen and it would be all over the news and then I think that that same thing could happen somewhere else around the world and nobody would ever really know about it. Yeah, but this happened 120 miles down the road from here, you know, it's not Transylvania. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's a mistake as well. I think that's a mistake to to think that information can only get lost because it's in some sort of far-flung... I don't know. I just what I'm th- saying is, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I would certainly lean towards in terms of probability a story like this would have survived and the reason being that you're falling into the range of time when things like witch trials were happening Mm. and that was like a huge hysteria up and down the country that stuff is quite meticulously recorded in pamphlets and in the press Mm. it wouldn't have just been like oh another vampire yeah it would have been absolute panic because you're dealing with a, a superstitious population who fear the supernatural but that depends on who knew about it to begin with yeah with hindsight you imagine something like that happening to a family and the family keeps it under their hat for a few generations okay and then it comes out later what i'm saying is that human stories get contorted and get lost all the time even things that are completely remarkable but what i was saying at that point in that point is what makes this story interesting, in a sense, is the claim that there were many witnesses. So it wasn't just like a ghost story where someone saw a grey lady walking down a corridor, two or three people saw it. Mm. I don't think there's a specific number of people given, but it's basically the whole population of Crogling Grange. So you could be talking dozens of people are supposed to have seen it. It's supposed to be a community event, almost. That's almost like what gives this story it sort of cash it. This is why it has been a story that's that's often raised as like a mass sighting, a mass event. That is its kind of guts, if you like. 
and it, you might be right maybe something happened that was mm. a lot smaller and it, it was limited to a lot fewer people but if that's the case yeah. you're still losing something quite critical from the story because you're almost losing that side of its kind of glamour so it's either a smaller much more modest event that yeah, only was yeah. witnessed by one or two people or it was the big event that they're making it out to be but the information has somehow been mm. lost so I don't know that's kind of all, all I was trying to say with that or it didn't happen at all or it didn't happen at all <laughs> yeah I, I like to think something happened but who knows what yeah the fact that it's so close to the opening of uh, Barney the Vampire mm, yeah it's certainly um, yeah it's certainly suspicious it's a shame we don't have a time machine Martin and we can't go back to find out what actually happened we'd need to find out when it happened first. <laughs> I know exactly exactly <laughs> I think that's part of the intrigue of these stories is that they're probably not true, but especially things that stretch back in time, it adds that layer of mystery to it, doesn't yeah. it? Where like in your more speculative moments you can kind of enjoy thinking, well, yeah. maybe, who knows? Yeah, exactly. So I think the sun is coming up. I think we've reached is. the end of the long winding road through the dark vampire filled bat like road night <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure and as always mate we'll hopefully have another episode for you guys soon but until then have a good night or morning or afternoon as the case may be goodbye and if you hear something tapping at the window it's probably just a window cleaner it's me and Martin and we've been drinking beer <laughs> hey bye 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 <laughs>